there you go. Good morning. Welcome to our Grace Baptist evening church service. Um, we're actually in Henderson, Texas doing this. Um, I've got a couple announcements to make that we want to make but we can't make yet. Uh, but we will be making them later. Just wet your whistle a little bit. Um, first of all, we want to have a word of prayer. Um, I want to say hi to everyone in Belize, Jonathan, Brother Newton, his family, Miss Cecilia, Fim, Ernesto and his family, Miss Abodia. Uh, hope there's uh, something you'll get out of this message this morning. I just wanted to uh, take the time, since I'm not there <clears throat> right now, I don't want to feel useless and want to just kind of continue uh, some of the teaching that we began when we were there. And this morning we want to talk about soul winning and uh, soul winning in prayer actually. I've been <clears throat> doing some studying and uh, I think it was last week I heard a message by Pastor Rocky. I, well, I didn't listen to the whole thing, but the part of it that we caught was uh, good and just reminded me of um, uh, the need for prayer in regard to soul winning. You know, we hand out tracts, we witness, we pray each day for opportunities, but we don't always spend a lot of time praying for the harvest, the overall harvest of the world, right? And uh, I think uh, Jesus told his disciples to lift up their eyes and look on the fields, for they're ripe already into harvest. Say not there's four months and then comes harvest. I say lift up your eyes. And then he, he told them to, to pray that the harvest is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. And so we're reminded that the harvest is the Lord's, right? Um, and we, we've always emphasized, because God has always emphasized it to us, and I guess maybe because of my spiritual giftedness, that's always really been my focus, um, not, prim not distinctly, but uh, in many ways primarily, that I've always had this, desire to go out and win people to Christ to witness and uh, which is very essential you can't have a church without an evangelist right they the, you can't have saints to equip for the work of the ministry unless they're saved and they can't be saved unless they believe and they can't believe unless somebody preaches right there has to be a biblical witness so in the priority of things we have to be careful you know, sometimes we overemphasize one thing or another, one gift of, uh, and, we, and we we agree with MacArthur when he talks about the, the gifted men, right? That there are gifted men given to the church. And so you have to be careful to overemphasize one over the other because whatever gifted men God has given to the church, he's given them uh, for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. And so... Um, it's my opinion that someone who is an evangelist is primarily a missionary, whether at home or abroad. Um, but that's their giftedness. That's their emphasis. And they are given to the church. You can't have a church without s saints. And you can't have saints without salvation, like we said. Um, and I think the, the evangelist seems to, that's his emphasis. And so... I think God uses an evangelist in a church. And of course, in, in American standards, it's kind of out of whack, you know. To, to us, an evangelist, just some guy drives around in his car with a little pinky ring on his finger and uh, goes from church to church, uh, you know. And, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that necessarily, but that's not necessarily what the gift of the evan the gifted man, the evangelist. Uh, is. I mean, he he has a gift. He has a, a vision, and God uses him just like he uses the pastor teacher to perfect the saints, to teach and to preach, like the apostles went and founded the church, the churches. And 
then the prophets, the New Testament prophets before they had the scripture were there in the churches to receive word from God, often um, ex tempore, um, to perfect the saints. And now we don't have apostles, we have evangelists, which is in a sense an apostle, which means one sent. But we have pastor, we have evangelists and pastor teachers now. They had, you know, we had the uh, uh, apostles and prophets, those gifted uh, areas, I believe, are ceased. They were foundational. But we still have an evangelist, we still have the evangelist and the pastor and teacher for the perfecting of the saints. Amen? And so I want us to go to the Lord in prayer. That's just a little introduction this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Um, uh, we'll just pray for those things we've already um, spoken about prayer requests we've taken over the last couple weeks. So let's just bow and go to the Lord in prayer and ask him to bless this time this morning. Our Father, we give you thanks for this day. We give you thanks, Father, for uh, your majesty. Father, you told us when we pray, pray our Father to remind us, God, that you are God, but you're our Father and that you care. And you said, pray our Father, which art in heaven, to Remind us, Lord, that you're not just a man. You're not just somebody down here on earth, but you're our Father in heaven. And that you're holy and you, you tell us to pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And, and so we take that, Father, to, to mean that our lives will be lived in such a way as to uh, not take your name in vain, Lord, but to reflect your character, that we, we in our lives will keep your name holy, that others can see uh, in us the God of the universe. And we pray your kingdom come, Lord, and uh, there, that means many things, but we just pray about the issue at hand this morning that we're going to speak on, that your kingdom come, Lord, that you will uh, open our eyes, open our hearts, give us a renewed vision, a renewed passion, Lord make you known to other people. God, we fell in love with you when you called us. and uh, We wanted to tell everybody, Lord, restore unto us the joy of our salvation and create in us a clean heart, Lord. Uh, renew a right spirit within us, Lord, that we might have that passion once again to win souls. And, and Father, we thank you for uh, everything, Lord, the good, the bad, the trials, Lord, the the, the quiet times, Lord, all the things that you uh, pass us through, Lord, in order to conform us to the image of your Son. Lord, we thank you for the times that you encourage us, Lord, that in spite of our faults, in spite of our failures, Lord, you remind us that, that, you're, that we're yours and you're ours. And, and though you're holy, Lord, you have made provision not to overlook our sin, Lord, but that you've covered our sin. And as we make mistakes and sin and stumble and fall, Lord, you take all those things and that you work them together for our good. You, you, you cause us to repent. And Lord, we thank you, God, that everything that happens has already been predestined for your glory and for our good. And so, Lord, that we thank you this morning for this opportunity we have again always to uh, come together to worship, to fellowship, and, Lord, to proclaim your word. Uh, Father, we just pray this morning for an option to uh, share this uh, in a way, God, that will be beneficial to others. And, Lord, I, I pray as uh, the pastor shared last week, Pastor uh, Rocky Otwell, that all of our prayers, Lord, is, is even this, what we call the Lord's Prayer, the Disciples' Prayer, Lord, that it points us to you, that your name be glorified, your kingdom come, your will be done. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. Thank you for working in our hearts and using your men, Lord, to help us. And, Lord, if it's you, not us, it's you that does that, to help us keep a balance in our Christian lives, Lord, so that we... As we move forward, we can do all the things that we need to do. But we can do it, Lord, with a, 
a compassion and a passion, Lord, in our hearts for you uh, with a peace and a quietness and a joy. And we just thank you for that. But help us, Lord. We know we can't do any of these things on our own. It's only by your grace, Lord, that we're saved, and it's by your grace that we continue, that we're kept uh, unto salvation, Lord. Grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace, my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. Lord, you, you've saved your people, and we thank you for it. Bless this time together this morning. We pray for Jonathan down in Belize, Lord. He's having problems again with a vertigo and, and also with some other type of dizziness and nausea. So we pray for him, Lord. We ask you to help him, whatever is the cause of that, Lord, that you would reveal that, Lord. And if there's just something he has to live with, we pray you give him grace. We pray for my brother Neil as he preaches today, Lord, you'll anoint him, use him. Pray that you'll bring everyone to church, that you'd have to come and be there this morning. And Lord, you'll save those that you would have to come. You'll add to the church daily, such as should be saved. We pray for Jamelia, uh, Brother Newton's wife, as she's about to give birth to another child. We pray, Lord, that you'll let that go smoothly. Lord, you'll help her, you'll strengthen her. Lord, we pray for Joshua. He's gone down to Belize and asked Chloe, down there to Mary and we just pray you'll work all those things out according to your will let things work smoothly if it's your will to do that and, but Lord we thank you for that thank you that out of all our ministry there in Belize Lord that you've, you've borne much fruit in, in many ways and that's one of them and we thank you for that and Lord we pray this morning that you'll, you'll speak to us you'll bless us Lord with your peace with your power with your presence Father, if there's anything in our hearts that we need to acknowledge and to repent of, Lord, we pray you'll show us that and help us, God, to uh, repent and to move forward, Lord, differently than we did yesterday. And now, Lord, we thank you for these things in Christ's name. Pray for our government. Lord, we pray for uh, Donald Trump as he's running for president again. He got shot yesterday. Lord, we just lift all that up to you. Pray your will would be done, Lord. If it's your will to grant us another, a more of a, another reprieve, Lord, and putting someone here into office, Lord, that will cause this nation to turn back in the areas it needs to, Lord, that this great nation could once again be what it has always been. But Lord, we know men are just men, and we trust in you, Lord. We, we know that you build men, you put character in men, you use men. To do your will and so we pray if it's your will this time that you'll uh, put Donald Trump back in office if that's uh, the method you'd use Lord to, to work in this country but we know God everything's got to go down one day we know the end's going to come we know there's going to be a great falling away we know all that Lord but we ask you Lord for time we pray if it's your will to give us more time and a more of a reprieve Lord that we can continue to win souls and bring others to Christ and you'll grant us that. And if it will mean putting Donald Trump in office to help us with that, to hold off the enemy for a while longer, then we ask you to do that. But Lord, we give you thanks because we know you're in control. You raise men up, you put men down. We don't put our trust in anything or anyone but you. But we do know you use men, Lord, so we pray for our nation that you'll continue to work here and make this nation continue to be what you want it to be. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so if you got a Bible, the first passage I want to look at is John 4, so I want you all to turn there with me, okay? We're here today not just to have church, right? We're here um, to, to learn, right? To not just learn intellectually, but... God meets with us, and we we want to move forward, right? We don't want to stay right where we're at in our Christian life, although uh, we're thankful for our lives. We're thankful for where we are, right? God brought us to where we are. But God doesn't bring us to where we are to leave us where we are, right? And so this, this has just been something that's always been on my mind. You know, my wife, Mary, back when we first met, you know, we were members of the same church, and 
she used to do a newsletter for um, the singles group and doing that newsletter she gathered um, articles and put them together and, and printed it and sent it out to everyone and she designed a part there that she had had me write articles for and it was called leaving tracks and it had a little picture on it with footsteps going across the top of the page leaving tracks right um, and that section was dedicated to soul winning to witnessing and to continuing to remind people that that's part of our duty as Christians amen so turn to John this is what we want to continue to do turn to John chapter 4 uh, you, you're familiar with the woman at the well um, Jesus met her and brought her to Christ and brought her to himself as uh, said he, must, he said I must needs go through Samaria and when he got there he met the woman at the well uh, you know the story um, when she find, when when Jesus finally dealt with her and opened her eyes she ran back into the city and went to all the men and told them come see a man that told me all things ever I did so immediately when she was converted she had a desire to go tell people right uh, and that was my experience and I believe it's the experience of every believer when you finally meet Jesus and you, if you're really saved, I don't mean you're just somebody who walked down the aisle of a church and prayed a prayer and went away the same person you were when you went down there. I'm talking about when you truly meet Jesus and he comes into you, washes, regenerates you, washes you clean, makes you a new person, gives you a peace and a joy that you never had before and, a, and, a, and, a assur and an assurance of his presence. And when you find that, when I found him, uh, the only thing I could think to do was get all the addresses I had in my in my belongings and I just started writing everybody that I knew and telling them what happened right I, I had to tell somebody right and I think that's the experience of, of every true believer is that when they finally have that intimate moment when Christ comes into them and washes them clean and and he becomes real to them there's always a desire maybe more so with some than others, but I think there's always that desire to want somebody else to know what you found. Uh, I use this analogy all the time because I remember I had one of my first girlfriends that I had when I was a teenager. Uh, somebody told me a little bit later that uh, about half of her friends stopped hanging around her because he, they got tired of hearing about me, right? Uh, kind of like when you know when you fall in love. I say you fall in love, but when you meet that person and you're in love, you want to you want to talk about them, right? That's the way it is with Jesus when you truly meet Him. And I'm, I'm telling you this, and I'm saying all this because you know we we can become mechanical in our in our soul winning and in our efforts to live for Christ. And sometimes we do that, but just because we know it's our duty. And even though we don't have a feeling and we don't have a passion, we know it's our duty to continue to do it, right? And so I'm not belittling that. Those mountaintop experiences sometimes are, are few and far between. We gotta leave the mountain and go back down to the valley. But down in the valley, we have to do what we're commissioned to do, right? And that doesn't mean just because you don't feel like telling somebody about Jesus today that you shouldn't do it, amen? I shared, uh, well, let me, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. Let me go ahead and read this passage and then I'll come back and we'll, we'll go through my outline. Um, the Lord Jesus, if you'll look at verse uh, chapter 4, verse uh, 31, I want to just make this point. Uh, in, the, in the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. Now, he had just won the woman at the well. The disciples had just come back from Walmart getting some sandwich meat and stuff. Oh, well, excuse me, I'm trying to relate too much here, but you understand. They, they went to get food and came back, right? Um, I don't know that probably Jesus sent them away on purpose because they may have gotten in the way because this not only was a woman, but it was a Samaritan woman that he was talking to. And they may not under, have understood why he would do what he was doing but anyway when they came back in the meanwhile his disciples prayed him saying master eat they knew he hadn't eaten anything but he said unto them I have meat to eat that you know not of 
Um, one thing that can be said about that, and I've said this many times, and I've, I've read other great men of God who have said the same thing, that there's substance to soul winning. There's substance to being instrumental in bringing others to Christ. There's, I mean, if you're truly saved and you, you're doing what God wants you to do, there is substance to that. There is actually a satisfaction that a Christian gets that he don't get or she don't get except for in this area, right? To be instrumental in bringing someone else to Christ, to have prayed for them and then to maybe have witnessed to them and see God open their eyes as a result an instrument of your instrumentality. Uh, if you've never experienced that, then it's kind of like getting saved, you know? I mean, you got to experience it to know it. And, and when you bring people to Christ, and it's, it's different with everybody, I'm sure, but there is substance to it. There's something that gives you purpose and meaning as a Christian. And if you're a Christian and you're not doing this, there is a purpose and a meaning to the Christian life that you're missing. Maybe it's why you bounce around so much and float around. Make this your primary duty. I'm, when I'm talking about duties, I'm not saying make it your only duty. I'm just saying get in your mind that this is a primary duty for the Christian. Gee, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's why he came. And if you're a Christian and you're not instrumental in bringing people to Christ, then you're not being a part of what he came to do. Oh, I know we pray for other people who witness and all those things. I understand that. Uh, but I believe that there's a, a place for every believer and there are people that every believer will be able to witness to, be instrumental in bringing him to Christ. But if you don't have the mentality to do it, you won't do it. If you don't have this in your mind that this is important and this is something I should be doing, not just praying for others to do. You see, you'll, you'll miss one of the greatest things I don't know what word to use here. One of the greatest um, yeah, things that will give you give you a sense of purpose. Uh, well, we're here to win people to Christ. We're here to be Jesus to the world, you know. And you can't do that if you're not telling people about Christ. If you're not every day, now I'm not. You got to make a habit of it. We still got the flesh. We got to struggle with all those things. But getting up in the morning. And getting into the Word a bit, a quiet time with the Lord, and pray. Read some Scripture and let God speak to you. But pray every morning. And in your prayer, God, help me. Give me opportunity today to witness. And I, I promise you, unless God's doing something different with me than He does with everybody else, God is going to give you those opportunities. And you'll see them when He comes. He may be giving them to you now, but you miss them. Or you don't see them because you don't have that perspective. People pass you by every day. But when I began to pray this and spend time with the Lord in the morning, when those opportunities came, I knew it. And it seemed that they would always come in, a, in an opportune time. It wouldn't be something I'd have to stop in the middle of my job with everybody watching me and do it. You know, it's just something uh, that would come in an opportune time. And I would know it and I would have an opportunity, whether it's to uh, just... just speak, you know, every situation is different, but to put in a word for Christ in a way that would point somebody to Jesus. Some cases you may be instrumental in, in bringing them to Christ because someone else has already planted seed. But there's substance. Jesus said, I have meat to eat that you know not of. And then he said this, therefore said the disciples one to another, hath any man brought him aught to eat? They think he's talking about food. You know, we, we care more about our food and what we eat than we do doing God's will. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? And Jesus said to them, My meat, my food, is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. To finish his work. Jesus Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's what he came for. And if we're his disciples, he said to his disciples, Follow me. Now, I know we're not all apostles, we're, and not all of you are evangelists, which are gifted men, 
but every one of us are in a sense evangelists we are all each to evangelize if you can't do anything else but tell people what Jesus has already done for you and how he saved you and make sure they know it's because of the gospel the death burial and resurrection of Christ see as you begin to do this you, you learn and you grow and it's something that really can't be taught I mean we can teach but but these things are things that have to be experienced for the most part but you, you, you won't grow in it and you can't grow in it unless you get started doing it that fear that you have just forget it you know in those times when God gives you an opportunity just say that one thing that comes to your mind and, and let God work amen if you'll open your mouth he'll feel it Jesus said to them, My meat, my food, is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Now he says this, he says this to the disciples, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already unto harvest. So that was in his day, but it's still true in our day. Lift up your eyes. There are people all around us, lost. Everybody you pass every day needs Jesus. Now, everybody you pass every day may not be one that is time and ready for you to, to be the one to witness to them, but maybe it is. But I think if you really get yourself ready, and I'm not saying uh, this, uh, I am saying this in distinction to making times and setting times to just go out and witness and hand out tracts. That's useful too if you have when you have time to do it. And maybe you should do it. Find areas or just go door knocking, right? Witness to people. There are many ways to witness. But what I'm talking to you about today is just basically everyday business, right? Getting up every day and as you go in your life beginning to witness. You can do it. If you're saved, you should do it. But you just got to get yourself set to do it, right? You got to make up your mind that you're going to do it and then pray god i don't understand this and i don't know how to do it but help me and he will and you'll begin he'll begin to give you opportunities and it just might be telling somebody that day well i know how you feel before i met jesus i went through that but but he changed my life and, and plant some kind of a seed there are many ways to witness right but the goal of witnessing is to bring people to the point where they understand who jesus is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That he died on the cross according to the scripture. He was buried and he rose again. And he did so to pay for our sins. To the, for the sins of all those who will believe. So he says, first of all, soul winning is substance. You know, doing God's will. And I know there are many other ways, many other things that are God's will. Right? But I think in everything we do, this ought to be our main goal. We ought to get our minds made up that we're to be like Jesus. We're to help him finish his work. He finished his part, and now it's to us to carry it on, right? And to win those people to Christ that he died for. How can they hear without a preacher? How can they preach except they be sent? Amen? So don't think that as a Christian, you don't have any purpose in this thing because you do. You have a place and this and you have a purpose this this will give you purpose as a Christian if you make up your mind to do this you will find a purpose that you didn't even know you had and you will have a sense of satisfaction in your soul when you do it I have meat to eat that you know not of I have some substance that you don't even know about and that's to do the will of God to finish his work amen and then he says, don't, don't put it off till tomorrow, right? Don't, don't look around and say, well, you know, we'll, we'll do it when the time's right. No, he said the time's already right. He says, say not you there four months and then comes the harvest. Of course, he's looking at the fields. I say to you, lift up your eyes. Look, look lift up your eyes. You know, I uh, don't want to say this in a negative way, but you know, most churches today, or many churches today, are just introspective. Their eyes are internal. They care and worried more about their stuff and their their people than anything else, and and there there should be that care, but but you can't have you can't be introspective. When I was a little less mature, I called it ingrown eyeballs. Amen. Church has got ingrown eyeballs, but you need to 
he says to these disciples and he says to us he says to us individually and to the church lift up your eyes and look on the field all those people that live around you a whole lot of those people are going to hell well God will send somebody well maybe it's you that God wants to send maybe he's going to have to send somebody else because you don't what did he tell Esther what did, what did Mordecai say to Esther Maybe it's for this cause of God raised you up. But know this, if you don't do it, God's still going to get it done. But you're not going to get blessed in it. As far as you're concerned, they might as well have gone to hell. Do you care? Amen. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields. For why? They're white already under harvest. Now, everyone has a purpose, right? I, I can't win everybody to Christ that I witness to it's in, a, in that sense of the word of the soul winning plans for the day. You know, you take them through the Romans road and get them to the place where they'll say the right words and say the right thing and then get them to pray a prayer. That's, that's not what we're talking about doing here. You know, God knows everybody's heart, but you do have to come to the place where you can bring somebody to the knowledge of the gospel as they're ready to hear it and even be instrumental in reaping the harvest at times. You know, God gives the increase. Apollos, uh, Paul, one plants, one waters, God gives the increase. Amen? He that reaps receives wages. Some get to reap the harvest and gather fruit unto eternal life that both he that sows and he that reaps may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one sows and another reaps. Now, my wife was sharing with me the other day, uh, she was at a yard sale and she gave a, a guy a track, a track the cross, I think we got him from Heritage. Uh, and she said, the guy just looked at her and said, somebody gave me this same track in Nacogdoches the other day, uh, over there on, on the square there where the brick road is. I don't know what to call that place. Um, and of course Mary asked me, did you witness? I, I did witness to somebody over there, but I don't know if it was him. Uh, so somebody had already given him that track. And, and, and maybe he read it, maybe he didn't. But when somebody else came along and gave him that same track, you know, sometimes people say, ah, oh, I think God might be trying to talk to me, right? God uses us, right? I think Josh was with me the other day when uh, we were coming back and the storm hit and I ran out of gas. I, I was out of gas and had to call, uh, I think we called Brother Luther and Brother Luna came and brought me some gas and I handed out a few tracks there. And the guy that came over and talked to us, I gave him a track. But, but Josh and I went on, I met Josh and Corrigan. Brother Luna gave me enough gas to make it to Corrigan and John, Joshua brought me uh, five gallons and put it in a car and made it home, right? But there were some guys sitting in the parking lot. And so I thought, you know, I always think this, you know, uh, you know, everything happens for a reason. I can get mad and say, God, why you let the power go out? I don't have no gas. Or I can say, God, why are you doing this? And when I, we sat there in that parking lot and I said, okay, Lord, this, this is the place that I happen to be because of this circumstance. And so maybe one of those guys standing over there needs the gospel. So I went over there and, um, gave him a track and I can't remember exactly the words the guy said but he, he told me uh, God's already been dealing with me about this thank you for doing that right? so one water one sows one waters God gives the increase right? but that's how God does it right? and, and you, every believer every one of us can be a part of that right? you can be instrumental in souls being saved and you should right we're not trying to get notches on our belts, right? We're just trying to be obedient and, and do what Jesus did. My food, my substance is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. There is substance to soul winning just as much as there is in everything else, right? But there's something about soul winning that is different than everything else that we do as Christians. I'm, I'm thankful for God letting me live a Christian life. I make mistakes. I'm probably the worst Christian I know, and I hate it. I hate it. But often I can't help it. I, I, you know, I, I, I'm not 
saying that to excuse anything. I'm just saying that the weights of the balance are in the hands of the Lord. You know, once we make the same mistake so many times, and then finally we get sick enough of it that we work hard not to do it, right? But God is the one that changes. Just like God's the one that saves us, he's the one that builds the character in us and changes our hearts each day so that the righteous man falleth seven times. And that's a number of completeness, right? We, we fall as many times as we have to to get it, right? But God promised all things work together for good. And that we're conformed, we're predestined to be conformed, right? So it doesn't make everything good. It doesn't make everything right. But God's in control. And where I am is where I am. And God helped me to get past this. Amen? I hate it. I think of Brother G.T. preached on blessed are those that mourn. Right? When that literally means that we, we mourn because of our frailty. Not because of our salvation. Praise God for that. But we mourn because of the imperfection that still remains in us. And the struggles that we still have. Blessed are those who mourn. It's that mourning that keeps us humble. It's that mourning that keeps us looking to Jesus. Amen. We're not happy when we sin. We used to love it. But now we loathe it. Amen. So there's a balance. And, and, but in all of that, you know, I, I witnessed to my little brother one time when I got out of prison. I, I, I backslid for a minute. Went and smoked a joint. Got miserable. I didn't get happy. I didn't. I began to mourn. God help me get out. I don't want to do this. But I remember I put that roach, that's what they call the little bud of marijuana cigarette, in my ashtray. And a year later, my little brother came over. And we and first we got in the car. And the first thing he did was reach over and open the ashtray. And looked in there. And he picked up that roach and he said, Oh, Christian, huh? Nothing I could say. Be sure you sin will find you out though, but nothing I could say. I just said, yeah, I smoked that a year ago. And I got miserable. And I just forgot I put the roach in there. I, but I haven't done it since, and I'm not going to do it by the grace of God, right? And so even our stumbling and our sin sometimes can be useful, right? To help people see that even though we're Christians, we, we can still struggle, but we still can get victory, amen? So, if I'm a bad Christian, should I not witness? It, it, no. Uh, if you're saved, you should witness. When you begin to tell other people about Jesus, it puts you in a position to have to live right, right? In some way, in, in a sense, right? The more you commit to Christ, the more obligated you are to live for Christ. And I'm not saying do it for that reason. I'm just saying it's true, right? Every one of us, no matter where you're at in Christ, no matter how uh, um, immature you are, no matter where you're at in Christ, you, you should still witness. Amen? That's what we're here for. I know there's so many other things that we're to do as Christians, but we're here to finish the work. We're here to be Christ to this world who came to seek and to save that which is lost. They can't live for the glory of God unless they get saved first. They can't show the, the greatness and the majesty of God in their lives until they get saved and grow, right? you got to grow. I'll tell you, as, as immature as I am, as what little bit of maturity I've had, it's taken 43 years to get here. What little bit of Christian character I have. It's taken 43 years, right? But in that 43 years, I, yeah, there's times we've grown cold and we've stumbled. But you know, the one thing I've never let myself do, not for any period of time, but uh, was to stop witnessing. It's that one thing that keeps my focus and reminds me who I am and what I'm here for. Amen? And it reminds me how important it is for me to do the right thing so that when others look at me, they can see Jesus. Well, they may look at me and see the mercy of God because he forgave me for something I did in their presence. My mama saw a preacher come out of the grocery store one day with what she was convinced was a six pack of beer. And from that day on, my mama had nothing to do with that preacher. I don't know if it was a six pack of beer or not. I'm pretty sure it was. But you know, what we do is important, yes. 
But I'll tell you, the more committed you are to win people to Christ, the more committed you will become to live for Christ if you're saved. Amen. You'll be reminded all the more that my life is important to somebody else besides just me. Amen. And what I do does affect other people. No man's an island. You can't live alone. I've shared this before, but I used to stand out in front of the stop and go in Pearland back years ago when I first got saved. I just I couldn't sleep at night. Sometimes God would wake me up and I'd go out and in the in the sleet and the snow sometimes, or in the sleet and the rain, and God just wake me up two or three in the morning. I'd just get up and walk down to the store or somewhere, and there'd be somebody pumping gas or something. And God would put on my heart, go give him a track. And I did that one night, and God just looked up at me. And he, he started, tears came in his eyes. And he told me, I just left my, 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 my grandmother's house, and she, and I can't tell you what's going on in my life, but she started crying. She wept as I walked out the door and told me, son, I'm praying that God will save you. And he said, I, that was in Alva, Texas, and we were in Pearland. And he just looked at me. I don't know what happened after that, but I gave him that track. And, and God just watered that seed. Amen. I was standing out front of that same stop and going Fridays, every Friday. And that track. This guy used to come every Friday. He'd walk past me and he'd <clears throat> say something under his breath about me and the tracks. And he'd go in and he'd buy a porn magazine and a six pack of beer. And he'd come back out and grunt at me again and get in his car and leave. One week. Uh, this is when the IBC root beer first came out. It was hot. It was in July. And I remember looking up on that sign on the door of the store uh, and seeing that frosty root beer up there, and I was thirsty. But this week he came in, and I heard him in there complaining to the staff. I'm getting tired of having to come in here. I'm, having, I'm getting tired of having to walk past that preacher out there to come in here and get my book, my magazine, and my beer. Y'all got to get rid of him or I'm going to go somewhere else and shop. Well, I heard you tell him, ain't no we can do it. It's public sidewalk. So the next Friday, I was standing there, and man, I got thirsty, and I said, I'm going to go in there and get me one of those root beers. You know, it was in brown bottle. And just as soon as I put my hand on that door handle, it's like the Holy Spirit said, don't you dare go in there and get one of those and stand out here on this sidewalk with a brown bottle in your hand. Right? That guy, the next week, went next across the street, pulled in, got out of his car, and looked over there at me with his hands on his hip, went in and got his beard and his magazine. But that day the Lord said to me, or actually, the Lord said to my heart, don't you do that. And that's when I turned, when I decided not to buy that beer, because God said, you know, he sees you with that, he's going to think you're drinking, and all that com conviction is going to be gone. And I just said that day, I'd rather be thirsty than to be a stumbling block, right? So as soon as I made that decision, he pulled up in his car, and he looked across the street at me, and he stood there with his hit, hands on his hips, and he went in and got his stuff, right? But God taught me a lesson with that, right? The souls of men are much more important than my satisfaction and all the things that I like, amen? And I think we ought to be careful, not just not to sin, but to do anything that would cause somebody to stumble, right? Abstain from the appearance of evil, right? Because you never know who's watching you. And I'm going to say this last illustration. Spurgeon was, took a break one summer. He and a young preacher that was in his school went, I think they... It says it was in Spain. And they were walking across the field. They had been fishing. And he was, at that moment, telling this young man how important it was and how he lived his life. Because you never know when somebody's watching. And about that time, a young man came across the field and met them and looked up and said, Oh, Mr. Spurgeon, I've been reading your sermons every week. And Spurgeon turned to the young preacher and said, See, you never know. Right? You never know when somebody's watching what you're doing. Amen? Now, I'm not saying anybody can make anybody go to hell. Because if God's got, has chosen somebody, they're going to get saved. They're going to get saved in spite of you if necessary. But I think it's God's will that we be useful to Him. Amen?
to be the best Christians we can be. But, the, but even as a stumbling baby Christian, you can still be useful to God and win souls to Christ. If you're saved and you have a testimony, you can tell that to somebody and confirm that the gospel works. That's what our testimony is for. When you give a testimony in court, you're saying, I know, I saw this, I witness. When you give your testimony to Christ, that's what you're saying. Yes, I, here's what God did for me. Here's how it worked. This is what God did. It's real. He's real. And, you know, being a Christian is more than just having a religion. I'm going to close with this. You know, it's an intimate relationship with God. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Having union and communion. That's what Christianity is. I think sometimes we get off so much that that, that communion is clouded. That's why Christians get bitter and angry. There's nothing worse than a backslidden Christian who ha is not walking in intimacy with Christ. And if you haven't, though, and if you haven't been, and that's what he said in Revelation, Lord. Go, go back to your first love. That's what David said after he said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Create in me a clean heart. You know, that clean heart is a willing heart. You know, when your heart's clean, it, it, you have a desire to tell people. It's a willingness to serve. Amen? Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Then, uh, put a new song in my heart. He said, then shall sinners be turned to thee, right? Then will sinners see and come to thee, right? It's more the joy and the passion that we have for Christ that wins people more than our moral deeds, which are part of that too, right? But it's more of that passion and that love people can see in your eyes for Jesus. That he's real. But they can't have that without Christ. They can't have that without the gospel. You can't be saved without the gospel. And the gospel doesn't preach itself. And the gospel is not inside of the heart. It's in, in, a, in every man to know there's a God. The creation tells you there's a God. But, that doesn't, but the gospel does not exist there. It has to be preached. There's an innate knowledge of God. But Christ, the gospel must be preached people don't know by nature that they're uh, about the son of God it has to be preached it says the Godhead so that people could know that God does have a son that there is a trinity that there is a triune God but it's like Helen Keller said she said once she finally learned to communicate she said after she became a Christian she said I always knew there was a God and I always knew that he had a son. I just didn't know who he was. And, but when I heard it, I knew it was true. Amen? So you could be the one to mention the name of Christ to some soul that you don't even know what's going on in their life. You just hand them a track and talk about Jesus, and boom, that could be the very thing that brings them to Christ. Because it's God that worketh amen, in us both to will and to do his good pleasure. Well, I, I hope there's something there that will help you this morning. Um, Dale Moody said that he made a commitment to God to never go to bed without at least having witnessed to one person. And I made that commitment with Dale Moody when I was a younger Christian. And I remember a night that I went to bed and I remembered I hadn't witnessed anybody all day. So I got back up put on my clothes and I walked out on the street and just looked around and sure enough somebody came walking by and I, I, I ain't going to say I led them in the center for everyone to cry but God, that, God gave me that divine appointment that night and I gave him that track and he went on thanking me and rejoicing that God was reaching out to him in the middle of the night amen so just be obedient you, you never know but God cannot save anybody. Uh, no, we don't say cannot. I think God does not save anybody without human instrumentality. It's our job 
to bring people to Christ. Amen. When I first met my wife, she she watched me hand out tracks all the time. We'd go through the bank, you know, in a little tube thing. I'd shoot, shoot up, you know. I'd stick a track in there and go up in there. And they'd send the tube back with a pin in it or something. And when she would do it, they'd always send her track back. She asked me one day, well, why do they always send mine back, but they don't send yours back? I said, I don't know. Maybe I've got a little more faith than maybe I'm expecting God to use. I don't know. But eventually they started keeping hers, too. You know, I, I don't know if I even need to say this, but, you know, I think my wife has witnessed to giving out more gospel tracts than many, many preachers have in their life. Amen? And one day when we get to heaven, I believe that uh, when we cross over that river, the Bible says that you can be saved yet so as by fire. I think just fire on your britches, right? Because you're alive. But, but it, the Bible says there will be an entrance ministered unto us into the good kingdom of God. And I think maybe, I don't know, we, we use the analogy that there's going to be somebody there waiting on me and thanking me for that track or for that time I took out of my day to sit down with them and set everything else aside and share with them. I've had times a young boy was getting ready to jump out of the window of a fifth story hospital room. I went up to see somebody else. And I saw him there, just like the Holy Spirit said, give him a track. So I walked over there and tapped him on the shoulder and gave him a track. I met him about two months later when I went out to a high school to hand out tracks during lunch. He came running up and asked me, do you remember me? And I said, no. He said, I was standing at the window on the fifth floor of Herman Hospital about getting ready to jump out because my mama just died. And you came over and gave me a track. And he said, I'm not going to lie to you and tell you I'm a Christian now, but you saved my life that day. And I'm thinking about what you said, right? So just, you never know, right? That, that little nudge you get from God to tell somebody something, that might be God rescuing them. Amen? All right, well, there, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Amen? Christ came to save sinners. Right? Eternal salvation is the main thing. Our Christian lives and our glorifying Him, they're wonderful. But that's an after you get saved. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time this morning. And I just pray, God, in some way you'll take this uh, feeble attempt to share these things. And, from my experience, Lord, and that you'll use them for your glory, that you'll nudge somebody, Lord, to, to start doing this, to start getting up and praying in the morning and setting their affections on things above and, and requesting opportunities and then begin to take them. Lord, I know it takes time and discipline to develop habits, Lord, I, but I pray you'll develop this habit in every believer that's here in this today. And Father, we'll give you thanks for it. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Anything else we need to talk about before?